Before we jump into this, I just wanted to do a little brief introduction. In this episode, I speak with Samantha Zippora. She is a reproductive justice activist. And in this discussion with her, I, I became aware of her because of a good friend of mine, Cassandra, who I mentioned in the interview, uh, had given me a copy of an upcoming release, an upcoming book that they had collaborated on uh, called Mapping the Yoniverse. And this book in particular, it has a great deal of information about anatomy, particularly uh, the anatomy of uh, bodies that are assigned female at birth. I guess I struggle a little bit with some of the terminology and the proper language that needs to be used. So for me, this was a bit of a learning experience, uh, just using the proper terms uh, for this and to not be exclusionary of people of varying gender uh, expressions. You know, this is for me, uh, talking to Samantha, it's about reclaiming something that was lost um, on the path to modernity, I guess, or, or, or to where we are right now, where so much of our um, uh, our understanding of our bodies and how we take, take care of our bodies has been uh, delegated to the realm of, of medicine, up to the medical community, the medical industry. And so many of the problems we have tend to exclude the multidimensional or hyperdimensionality, as Samantha puts it, of the human experience of human beings, that often what's happening to us is multi-level. And so in understanding, for instance, the medical anatomical um, terminology, using the proper terms and understanding that on that level is super important. But it's also understanding that there's other things that need to be understood, ancestral knowledge that needs to be addressed and acknowledged and reclaimed. Um, this is all about reclaiming our autonomy as human beings. And I think particularly as we enter a time of, of increasing crisis and stress, um, on multiple fronts, it's important that we reclaim what has been lost on this path to to the moment that we're in collectively right now. So this is partly why I'm interested in talking to her. Also, I was just really curious about such things as, for instance, she uses the term pregnancy release in her work, talking about how menstruation, um, uh, miscarriage, uh, bringing you know pregnancy to full term, um, all these different terms that we use to describe different things, or abortion, for instance, uh, she uses the broader, more umbrella term, um, pregnancy release. And I ask her, why does she do that? Um, we also get into that t- topic of abortion, of miscarriage, of of the ways in which we've delegated that to the realm of the medical, um, and also to the, the realm of politics and law in the state, which those are all important. But something that Samantha really wants to highlight is that, hey, actually women and and people who identify not as women, uh, people who uh, who ovulate, who menstruate, who get pregnant, um, they've, there's been practices, there's been very, very safe um, and longstanding traditional practices of how to address these things uh, in cultures around the world, and that we all come from that. You know, whether we feel disconnected from it or not, we do have that in our lineages if we just dig far enough look back far enough into our own lineages. So this is what this discussion with Samantha is about. It's about, it's very sex positive. It's very positive about the body. It's about understanding our bodies. And whether you identify for myself, for instance, I'm a cisgendered male, I'm heterosexual, I'm white, I'm pretty privileged in just right out the gate, basically. So being able to have these discussions and being able to understand that we're all a part of this, you know, um, that we're not excluded from this in any way just because of our particular sexual orientation or, or gender expression or, or our biological bodies. Um, there is a great deal of ignorance about our own bodies in this time, and we need to reclaim that. That's a big part of the work that needs to be done, and it is sacred. It is sacred work. We get into a lot of really great topics of discussion in this. I, I was able to go up to her home in Boise, Idaho, where she currently lives, and talk with her about this. So I got to record this on video, of course, and uh, have this conversation in person. And I felt really lucky to do so. I had a really great discussion with Samantha. So if you want to learn more about her, go to her website, samanthazippora.com. So just go check her work out. Of course, you can follow her on all, very, all the various social media sites as well. So I'll put links to all that in the description of this episode. And I really want people to go check out her work. I really thank Samantha for her... her her ability to speak so clearly on these subjects and know so very much about something that I think is really quite uncommonly known 
at least I, I don't know many people that know this type of stuff. So it was really great to get to know her a little more with this interview. Uh, so go check her work out. Thank you very much, Samantha, for the time, and thank you for listening. Here's my interview with Samantha Zipporah. If I only had it now Okay. So I am recording. Oh, okay. I just want to just let you know, um, yeah. obviously this isn't part of the interview yet, but um, it's, fine. it's funny. I just, I do so many interviews online. So it's like a phone call. Mm-hmm. So much of what I do is like phone calls or Skype, whatever. And most of the time, if I do an interview in person, I know that person pretty well. So I met you today, like 10 minutes ago or something, yep. and I'm now in your home, you know? So it's just sort of... Uh, it's an interesting dynamic, but I already feel really familiar with you just through your, just listening to some of your uh, interviews and reading this book here. And so can I just ask really quick? Yeah. I'm just going to show it just in case we use this for the interview, but sure. mapping the Yoniverse and it's a, am I saying that correctly? Yoniverse? Yoniverse? Yoniverse. Yep. Uh, so I got this from my friend Cassandra who illustrated this and it's an anatomy coloring book. Um, and, uh, I haven't seen, I don't see this on your website. Like I don't see any other copies of this. So I feel pretty special that I have a copy. Yeah. In fact, I want you to sign it if you get a minute, if you're into that kind of thing. Happily. Okay. Okay. But yeah, I just wanted to ask, like, is there anywhere the people, someone was actually, I was actually reading it. I was researching it in a cafe yesterday and someone's like, what is this book about? I was like showing all these anatomy, you know, diagrams and they're like, they weren't offended at all. They were just like, oh, like. I think this is a great resource. It's actually really useful. Like I could really use this right now, and I'm like, well, any everybody could. I'm learning a lot from it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if you had. I just think it's a great resource. I would love it's if it's just too. on Patreon mm-hmm. 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 and in my living room and in Boise right now. So it's at a couple shops in Boise and on Patreon, and I'm gonna do the public launch probably next month. Okay. Maybe not till solstice. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I guess so. It's like this is sort of a pre-release that I'm... Yeah. Oh, okay. So I thought this was yeah. like something... Yeah. I mean, something she was there. the illustrator. So that's right. probably like one of the test copies. I think it is. If not the test copy. But it's just, I mean, this is what I was... It's just so funny. Like, I'm like, I'm 30 years old. I've, I've mm-hmm. had, you know, numerous um, partners... Um, and I like to think like, okay, I kind of know my way around a body, you know, but like, there's so much that I'm sure that women don't even understand about their own anatomy. And that seems sure. to be what's going on in this book is like, you're just, it's very, it's respectful, it's empowering, and it's like trying to reclaim um, autonomy and sort of con- uh, sort of knowing your own body and what's happening to it and how to listen to signals that are coming from it. Um, can I, maybe just the first question, it's just totally, um, I'm kind of just going with what's popping up in my head right now, but sure. like something that came up while I was reading this, there was something about menstruation and that it, pain, painful menstruation is sort of seen as this very normal, every woman generally, many women have very painful menstruations. Yeah. My sister, for instance, one of my sisters, I remember when I was, when I was very young and she was a teenager she would have to go to school or, you know, take sick days because she, their menstruations were so painful. And I've known many women like this. And so I guess I was wanting to ask just how you were kind of pointing to something like something is obviously wrong in your body if that's happening. So what do you say to that? I'm just curious, just out of just pure curiosity, because I know so many people that have suffered from this ailment. Yeah. So... I'm, it's interesting being filmed. I'm like, (laughs) you have this like camera looking at you. I I get it. (laughs) Looking at you though. I know. Um, (laughs) So the physiologic process of menstruation is not an inherently painful one. Mm -hmm. If the body is producing sensations of pain, that is really valuable communication that something is wrong. 
There is a blockage of energy Mm -hmm. somewhere. There's a lack of nutrition. There's an imbalance of hormones. Um, And something being wrong, something being out of place and out of balance can be on any dimension, Mm -hmm. right? It Mm -hmm. can be on the psycho-spiritual dimension. It can be on the physical dimension. We're hyper-dimensional beings. Mm -hmm. Our uteruses are some of the most communicative parts of the body um, for keeping us in alignment with health and balance Mm. and our purpose Mm. when we turn tune into them okay um so so it's every woman it would be different it would be a different reason maybe for why they're experiencing menstrual pain every woman it would be different there are some very um general issues with modern day american culture for example um, not to mention the, right, the abuses of the, on the psycho-spiritual level about what our belief systems are, about our ability to menstruate right. or ovulate or reproduce and how, what, what are the cultural narratives, right, mm-hmm. and beliefs shape reality. Mm-hmm. That's one level and one dimension. Um, but on a very basic biochemical level, our, our entire society is... Um, exposed to a whole lot of endocrine disruptors. Mm, right. Most of them uh, increase estrogens in the body. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of things like sore breasts and acne and bloating and like extreme mood swings. Mm-hmm. Not all of these things are due to, to estrogen excess, but a lot of them can be and plastics and household cleaners and mm-hmm. cosmetics and all conventional meat and dairy and produce um, contains xenoestrogens. Right. And then we have also about 60% of our generation uh, choosing to suppress their ovulation with a medication that also uh, has xenoestrogens in them that are then pissed out into our water. So I'll stop there. Right. So there's... (laughs) Because there's a lot there. It's multi-level. I mean, yeah. Very... I mean, that's my my work, right? Is creating this bridge... Sure. And this conversation, mm-hmm. um, like a practical lucidity about the fact that we are hyperdimensional beings. Right. Um, I always want to try and be really clear and objective about what is true in this dimension, like right. to the best of our knowledge right. and see that as a foundational human right, that we have access to that information mm-hmm. before we make decisions about how we care for our bodies. Right. Um, but there's also, I mean, this is in the the book Yoniverse, Mapping the Yoniverse, um, there are several energy anatomy right, yeah, diagrams you... as well because we have subtle bodies, etheric bodies, energetic mm-hmm. bodies that affect our physical realities. Right. Absolutely. No, I, <laughs> no, I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, I think it's not that I, I don't reject those ideas at all. I just, I think it's funny. I'm still kind of recovering from... Mm-hmm. I grew up religious, mm-hmm. talked about this before many times, but like I grew up Mormon. So there's that left when I was 18 ish. Whoa. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, left that behind. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was this like, I'm an atheist, you know, I'm a, sure. a rational like man and I gotta be like, none of that bullshit, you know? Yeah. yeah. And now I'm kind of coming back. <laughs> I'm kind of coming back mm-hmm. into this sort of balanced view of things where I definitely have that more rational side of myself, but I'm trying to be more, um, intuitive and sensitive mm. to the hyperdimension hyperdimensionality if that's the right way to say that sure, sure. of human beings and yeah. we're not one thing we're many things intersecting with everything and so of course when we talk about like I, that's why i think women and, and sort of we call femininity in just a broad sense is a deeply mis often misunderstood suppressed oppressed thing in our culture And so for me to kind of get away from this hyper-rational, atheist kind of thing is actually to um, reclaim something that's been lost. That's kind of how I've looked at it anyway. Because that's, you know, you know what I mean? So I think when I was texting you about what we wanted to talk about, I think I unloaded a lot of thoughts on you of my intentions with this interview. But I did say something about, you know, what are you trying to reclaim in your work? Um, I've been really 
influenced by, say, uh, I've had, a, had an interview once with Sylvia Federici, who wrote Caliban and the Witch. Yeah, beautiful. You know? Yeah, she's a beautiful woman. Um, great. The book really blew my head open. Um, Good. I did not understand the impact the witch hunts had, um, mm-hmm. really, and the transformation that had in, in kind of creating capitalism and everything we have today. But um, I guess, to me, when I look at your work, I'm seeing women, particularly women, reclaiming something that had been disrupted or um, purposely uh, attempted to be put away and repressed um, lineage of knowledge and wisdom that's been um, um, almost destroyed in many places. And so I, I look at your work and I'm like, this is like deeply needed right now. It's always been needed, but it's especially needed right now because we're hitting... We're up against the wall in more ways than one. And so how do we reclaim our autonomy? How do we reclaim our bodies? And this is just as relevant for so-called men as it is for women. You know what I mean? And that's what I'm kind of coming into this conversation with. So to fit that into a question for you, I feel like I said a lot. I, I do this. I talk too much. Um, <laughs> what is your journey? I know I started the interview off with this like menstruation question, but like I should have started it this way instead. But like your journey to this point, I mean, you have a very, I mean, you're unique, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, you're, you're kind of challenging people's notions and assumptions about many things. And that takes a lot of like self care and confidence yeah. to do that. So what do you, how did you come into this work? It's a big question. Yeah. Um, I am extremely blessed to have been provided <laughs> with a very mystical shamanic path. <laughs> okay. Awesome. No less. No less. Okay. Um, I received insight into what my work in the world was before I started menstruating, which is um, a really historical anthropological um, phenomena mm. with the cycle, with with menstruation, with blood mysteries, with womb wisdom, mm-hmm. um, and with the path of a healer that one would actually receive and then continue to refine their sense of purpose in the world with the process of menstruation. Mm -hmm. So we can bookmark that (laughs) um, if you want to discuss it more, but I will just put a little shout out to the book Wild Power that is from the Red School for a really clear, uh, beautiful discussion of some more of that topic. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a tremendous amount of ancestral trauma as a Jew Mm -hmm. and as a witch. As mm-hmm. a Jewish. Okay. Yeah. And I apparently showed up in this body to work with and transform a lot of that for both myself as an individual and the collective of my family and our culture. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I started studying when I was 11. Wow. And I always say that my first doula job was helping somebody put in a tampon mm-hmm. behind a bathroom stall. Um, or from the other side, talking her through the process. Um, here's one hilarious, trippy moment that your nerd friends might appreciate. <laughs> you might appreciate Just as my, my nerd, nerd friend. friend. <laughs> um, I got my first period at the movie theater watching The Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome, I guess. It's a good thing, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's one bit. Um <laughs> I started working at Planned Parenthood in junior high school. I started lobbying with legislature here at the Boise Capitol as a junior high school student, providing contraceptive um, and STI and pregnancy options counseling for my community Mm -hmm. as a 13, Mm -hmm. 14-year-old. I started attending births in my 20s, and actually I attended my first abortion uh, at 16, mm. I, I have a lot of spectacular uh, dreams around birth and death in particular and things related to the veil. Okay. Um, mm. I had a traumatic hemorrhage when I was 21 years old where I lost two-thirds of my red blood cell count. Wow. Um, and received six pints of blood and a dilation and curettage procedure, which is a standard abortion procedure. Mm-hmm. Um, so... I have 
I don't know what it's like to have um, a reproductive or sexual body without analyzing it, (laughs) Um, studying it really hard, uh, reading a lot about it. My first love was an anthropology and philosophy major. So we talked about like the biochemistry and the anthropology of our sexual urges for like three months before I had sex. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) For the first time. Wow. Um, And (laughs) yeah, I'm 33 now. So Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. I've been menstruating for 21 years. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Consciously. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And then I started tracking my ovulation when I was 19. Mm -hmm. So that's 14 years of fertility awareness and ovulation awareness. And I, I find that this cycle is one of my best teachers. And I see it uh, as this microcosm Mm -hmm. of the macrocosm of creation. And I think that by interacting with it mindfully, Mm -hmm. we have the ability to gain insight and uh, clarity and inspiration for the way that we interact with all of creation. <laughs> well, I think that's the thing about the, about yeah. ovulation and the that cycle it's is our ability to create life, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean it's so deeply connected <laughs> to the whole thing. I think of seasons. I think of the cycles of the natural world, living, dying, the whole thing, and that's just like directly connected to the way that women's bodies work, typically. Um, yeah, and I'll just. Know. In, in me, gently, yeah, yeah, the, gently in a call-in way, um, <laughs> because it is important to me, and I love people mm-hmm. that are non-binary and trans, mm-hmm. um, and it's an important threshold for my work, mm-hmm. and it's a controversial threshold for my work. Mm-hmm. Um, but I use the word people, people okay. instead of women, okay. And there is there is some confusion and grief and lack of total clarity around that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a whole other podcast episode. Sure. But um, yeah, there's lots of people who don't identify as women right. who menstruate. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. Thank you for pointing that yeah. out. I'll, I'll, I'll try to... And I to... think that's part of yeah. the healing and the balancing of the oppression of patriarchy in our culture, mm-hmm. The what is going on with the culture mm-hmm. of questioning and challenging gender norms right. and binaries and duality. Mm-hmm. And I'm... I'm part of that movement. That's right. my heart is really right, right. tenderly um, tied up in that fight. Okay. Okay. So people who uh, yeah, yeah. Mens- people who menstruate. People who menstruate. Okay. Cheers Perfect. to that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a beautiful explanation, um, and it was very gentle. So thank you for that, because I, I think there is this sort of almost a tension that comes up when that topic is even raised because it's yeah. like you fucked up you can't say that and then that, that's yeah. what happens sometimes and i oh god and, I, been... and i'm just and i'm just i don't know conditioned or trained or yeah. something to speak a certain way so yep. yeah no anyway so it's just it's part of helping the most marginalized oppressed communities yeah no absolutely with our privilege when we're able like absolutely it's not that big of a privilege right to or uh, input um Imposition. Imposition, yeah. To say people. Okay. So I want to talk about, <laughs> yeah. though, I mean, I was reading a post, um, an article or, or essay that you had written called Aesthetic o- Ovulation Awareness. Nice. Because mm-hmm. you're talking about ovulation, so I wanted to tie that. You have two things, and the first one is actually comes a little later, but you say when you were talking about how that ties into everything, you say our bodies, our ecosystems, and our fertility is an energy source. So yeah. that's one thing that came up. And the second one's a little longer. I'm just going to quote it really quick. Oh, thank you. Take your time. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) You say, uh, the cultural educational norm in the United States is complete ignorance of the value and physiology of women's fertility or people's fertility. Uh, The ignorance and pathologizing of our fertility is a direct result of systemic oppression. The dominant paradigm of patriarchy and consumerism are inherently damaging to our autonomy and self-awareness. Perpetuating ignorance, fear, and suppression of women's fertility is highly profitable to those in power. The idea that people are incapable of understanding and responsibly managing our fertility is pervasive. Rather than integrating uh, women, people, and their biology, 
the arbiters of mainstream culture prefer to devalue silence and compartmentalize nature rather than learning to live in synergy with the feminine cycles of transformation that are inherent to the growth of all living things the dominant paradigm worships control and stasis fuck yeah that was such a powerful <laughs> paragraph like i Thank think we could just end the interview right yeah. here <laughs> oh no yeah. i i uh that that reading that part i mean the whole thing was wonderful and you talked a little earlier about tracking your ovulation your menstruation cycles and yeah. uh and you mentioned that in that piece um nice so i think where where can women or people who are we don't identify as women um find their power in this culture that is as um dominating in so many aspects of people's lives do you know what i mean mm. where can because i feel like you particularly what is exciting about your work is you've like carved out space you've carved out a, a little space here where people can come oh. and be very honest about what they're feeling and and they can come openly with questions and you're here to provide to the best of your ability that knowledge and wisdom that you've attained mm-hmm. and um i feel like it's a growing thing but it's still not at maximum capacity yet you know it's not like we're seeing witches in every community you know what i mean i mean i'm gonna go back <laughs> home and there's nothing like that where i live do you know what i mean um i bet she's there you just don't I, yeah she's you hidden just haven't met her yet yeah. we've been hiding a long time and you know there's a reason for that yeah yeah like uh, <laughs> so with with so th- let's take for instance let's take this topic um abortion it's a very loaded term for a lot of political reasons but you actually use different terminology uh-huh. um you call it pregnancy release and that actually is more of a term that encapsulates uh miscarriage um actually giving birth to a baby, um, abortion, um, and all these things may be in between, whatever they may be. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll guess I'll ask this question, which is, you chose that term for a good reason. I want to ask what that reason is. Mm-hmm. And the second thing I would ask is, when it comes to these subjects surrounding um, pregnancy release, I mean, um, how important is it to you to convey like that we need to have more of a positive and self-affirming life-affirming attitude about these things which have this dreary aspect to it for some reason you know what i mean i don't know if that's a good question but that's kind of what's coming up right now sure well speaking to the term pregnancy release um it's meant to normalize and unify these experiences of having a pregnancy and then releasing it um, because there are a lot of extremely important commonalities that are very infrequently honored or acknowledged or known about. So regardless of how a pregnancy ends, there is extreme alchemy, again, on these hyper dimensions, Mm -hmm. um, on a cellular level, we're never the same once we've been pregnant, (laughs) our cells are are changed for life. Um, And there is an intrapartum, a pregnant period, a birthing experience Mm -hmm. of some sort, Mm -hmm. a release of some sort. And then there is a postpartum period um, where our physical bodies as well as our emotional and psycho-spiritual bodies are more vulnerable and um, deserve care. Right. (laughs) Deserve to be honored and cared for and nurtured by our relationships in our interpersonal intimate lives as well as our community cultural lives. Um, So normalizing is is huge getting really clear and honest about the fact that only about half of conceptions known conceptions medically clinically statistically speaking whatever the fuck statistics really are um (laughs) only about half of pregnancies end as a baby right really (laughs) about half of them end in miscarriage or abortion and actually on a clinical, technical terminology level, all miscarriages are abortions. When you look at the codes that are written up by medical care providers, every single type of a miscarriage is clinically an abortion. And because of the, this is because on a physical level, our, 
our anatomy does not have a preference or an attachment to the reason that we are releasing a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. It could be a biochemical genetic issue that causes a, mi a miscarriage, or it can be an emotional, psychological reality where somebody makes a choice. Mm -hmm. And the tools and the methods by which this pregnancy is expelled um, vary by individual, but the reality that there was a pregnancy, a birth, and a postpartum period remains the same across experiences. And our ability to carry pregnancies and release them, similarly to our ability to ovulate and menstruate, is something that it's not just the obligation, mm -hmm. um, but it's the honor of our community to tend to people who are actively bleeding and people who are able to carry and give life in the way that our bodies do. Yeah. So that's, that's an aspect of an intact, healthy culture right. is that it respects the womb mm -hmm. in all of its processes because it's where we all originated, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of <laughs> so course. You, like, well, isn't that the thing, though, that's – I mentioned Federici in that um, the witch hunts, but this idea of transforming the body into, like, a factory or something industrial or something that serves – men mm -hmm. and serves the society whatever that is mm -hmm. the leviathan i guess um it's like women like it's like the, the the womb does not become the center of the community it becomes this like asset for for profit or something sure for control for domination and so it it seems like it's such a common sense thing you're saying it's just like it feels so deeply true to me at least. Mm -hmm. And I think many people will listen will feel that as well, like making the womb, because that's where life comes from. Yeah, it's like, why are we, like, there's, okay, there's so many different philosophies around religion and theology and myth. Right, right. <laughs> right? And uh -huh. like our creation myth and our origin stories. And these are really potent and beautiful stories. And that's another podcast, right, about mm, yeah. <laughs> our collective <laughs> unconscious and mythology. Mm -hmm. But this is, um, the approach that I have to educating people about the menstrual cycle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that this is the origin story. Mm, right, yeah. <laughs> like, stop with all of the insane questioning and all of the oppressive uh, dogma and all of these other things of, like, where do we come from? And be like, hey, you guys, we, we come from uteruses. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just stop there. That's maybe good. let's respect them. Yeah, no, I maybe get let's that. learn about them. Maybe they have something to teach us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I agree. So let me ask. This is just a. It's purely just out of curiosity because. Great. That's a great place to come from. <laughs> but you talk about postpartum, and of course, something that comes up is like postpartum depression. <sighs> what I know that's a big subject, but uh -huh. I'm like, but I get worried because I wonder, mm. like, what is that coming from? Is it something similar mm -hmm. to what I mentioned with menstruation and Absolutely. the pain of menstruation? It's like the, the conditions. There's a lot of um, intersecting Isolation, things. Isolation. And lack of oxytocin and mm -hmm. poor nutrition. Um, there's so, so many, many factors. things okay. that are contributing to that. Um, okay. But those are pretty good, actually, like off the cuff. Isolation, lack of nutrition. And what was the other one? I forget. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> everybody when they're actively bleeding, which is menstruating or postpartum period, um, some hot tips, <laughs> hot <laughs> tips from traditional cultures, <laughs> right? It's like bleeding people need to have extra rest, yeah. extra warmth and extra nutrition that is really high in minerals so that we don't become anemic. And if you're not doing those things when you're actively bleeding, it's going to hurt. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it, the longer that you go without doing those things, the more it's going to hurt. So, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of nuance there, but I would say that isolation would be even bigger than the, like the physical realities, the social animal part of us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is so core to our birthing experience and our mothering yeah is we're social creatures we are not meant to be alone right <laughs> during those times and we are certainly not meant to be 
away from the baby for the amount of time that most people are in our culture. Yeah. So 40 days is the most basic universal postpartum period in most traditional and indigenous cultures. Okay. And during those 40 days, you have extremely restricted activities and you eat special foods and you're honored in a very special way. You're like lucid, right? Right. Yeah. You're porous to the spirit. Well, it's like they just move through you. Yeah, you have. I mean, that's a huge transitionary period in a person's life. That's like. Yeah. That's supposed to be acknowledged and respected by those around you, Mm -hmm. right? And and again, in our culture, it's very isolating and doesn't seem like that's respected or understood at all, even by your partner who's supposed to be there by your side and respect that. And they're Mm. like, "Why aren't you going back to work yet? Or why aren't you doing this and this?" And there's all of these pressures on families and and partnerships today anyway but it's really disheartening to see that when i see that um but i i I, so speaking kind of stemming from that i mean postpartum depression you talk about ritual too being a big part of this like Mm -hmm. there are rituals or ceremony that can be uh engaged that people can engage in um because it is such a huge shift and transition in a person's life and I think probably some of the postpartum depression comes from this sense that maybe it's not acknowledged that you just went through something harrowing, maybe life affirming, and maybe just scared the shit out of you. You know what I mean? All the things that happen when a person's giving birth. Yeah. I mean, how else would you feel, you know, except that? And then there isn't really, like, we have, this is the case for, for a lot of different scenarios and people, but there isn't this, like, acknowledgement there isn't a ceremony there isn't a ritual put right in of passage. a rite of passage exactly mm-hmm. so in in your uh, this kind of actually ties a little bit into this discussion around cultural appropriation versus appreciation ah yeah right mm-hmm. but drawing because i think speaking as a basically a white person um we've supposedly abandoned our heritage and whatnot so i don't have anything to draw upon I mean, when I say that, I mean, when my ancestors came here, that was part of that process of assimilation. So I don't have this like deep sense of like, I know what my ancestors did to deal with these situations. That's what I mean. You haven't dug far enough. It's true. And I haven't. You have to pull deeper at the roots. No, I totally agree. At the roots, we were all connected to the earth and the cycles of which our womb cycles are part of. Mm -hmm that earth wisdom yeah Yeah. and And like the word month comes from the word menses comes from menstruation right like all time like the western concept of how we measure time comes from the menstrual cycle (laughs) right well that makes a lot of sense right (laughs) yeah so the great cosmic mother and chalice and the blade would be your homework assignments (laughs) okay okay chalice and the blade i've heard um, i've uh, heard if you you wanted to take um take them on right um I'm sorry. What was your question? I think it was uh, <laughs> it was uh, rites of passage, ritual, yeah. ways that we can maybe, or you have at least drawn on maybe your ancestry. Ritual and initiation. Yeah. Yeah. My ancestry. Oh, yeah. It's huge. Yeah. Um, I think that you know, I've been through a lot of evolution uh, in my connection to spirituality and ritual and religion. Um, at the point that I had a bat mitzvah, Mm -hmm. I was like super angry about it, thoroughly rejected all organized religion and felt like it was this empty ritual I had to do and everybody expected me and I felt gross about it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of disconnected from Judaism for the most part, uh, in terms of my day-to-day life and my, my wheel of the year cycle, um, for most of my teens. And I came back to it in my twenties. Interestingly, like when I started attending births again. Um, But my relationship right now is really beautiful in that I feel like it's this supportive structure Mm -hmm. that I am capable of moving freely and expressing myself within. Uh, And it feels like a support structure. And I take and let go of whatever resonates and feels good for me to do as far as Judaism goes, but it's, it's a lunar calendar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's got a lot of mirroring of, of the witches or pagan calendar as well. Okay. Okay. Um, and there's, you know, like a celebration that's a holiday for trees. 
Mm-hmm. There's Passover, which is such a fertility birth holiday. I adore it. Okay. Um, yeah, lack of lack of ritual, lack of rite of passage creates massive um, illness in a, in a culture, especially related to our ability to create life, especially related to the menstrual cycle, related to sexuality, related to pregnancy. The fact that there is no healthy initiation when we receive our power, mm-hmm. our mm-hmm. ability to reproduce, which is a power, which is a direct line to the divine, to mm-hmm. our ability to create, um, having some sort of initiation process around that and rite of passage is, in my opinion, one of the main reasons that our culture is so ill Yeah. in those ways. Yeah. No, I, um, yeah. No, I... Yeah. <laughs> and I just want to yeah. say also that one of the things that's extremely important for a, a healthy rite of passage is community. Mm-hmm. You don't have a rite of passage or a ritual by yourself on the mountain only the being received and acknowledged and witnessed by a community is a huge part of why a rite of passage is one. Right. Um, so when we're talking about coming into our sexual power, coming into our fertility, coming into motherhood, mm-hmm. right. These are all initiatory experiences right. that our community should be witnessing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in order for us to integrate in a healthy way. So, I've talked about initiatory rights through, I guess, masculinity um, in the masculine sense, because I feel that what men in particular lack in our culture are uh, men, whatever people initiation. that identify as initiation, because yeah. there is certainly this like biological shift that happens, whether you identify as male or female or, or non-binary, but um, people go through biological changes and I and I and I assumed that and I assumed that you know women or self-identifying women uh, assigned at birth women um, that it was a far more like natural and like pro like it, like initiatory rights just sort of is a part of the the biology and just just how I kind of viewed it yeah and I thought that for men. Uh, that are growing up in cultures that are like, you need to go out and we need to put you through a process yeah. to make you know who you are in the community now, that you are a man, this sort yeah. of, right? So I feel like for men in particular, um, I was just assumed that that was, but I, but what you're pointing to is that women have, or or, or people that are, sorry, you're fine. I'm fucking this up so bad. You're good. Um, <laughs> you're, you're growing. I'm trying. Well, it's I'm, uncomfortable. Well, it's like, I think it's hard for me is because it's, um, mm-hmm. the words seem appropriate in certain contexts and then in other contexts they don't. I think that's where I'm getting fucked up. Do you know well, what I mean? You also don't need to grow and change and be perfect right now. I'm you're it's okay, okay that I, just I made want, that suggestion and that I shared yeah, that thought right. and that you're not fully actualized <laughs> and integrated with that thought yet. Yeah. No, it's yeah. It's great. Okay, okay, cool. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. But I'm just trying to convey the general idea that I'm trying to get across as initiatory rights. And, okay. and I assume what you by what you're saying that uh-huh. um women um have similar things where the community res- re- you know puts them through initiatory rights as well. Yeah. And then that, that's the case then. Of course. Yeah, that's such an obvious thing that I never really put together. Yeah. Because I'm, you know. It's okay. You're learning. That's <laughs> yeah. great. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a great place. It's a good thing to do. Okay. Yeah. But I wanted to ask, yeah, yeah I just want to ask, like, that's such an obvious thing, but I imagine, so if, if we're not, this comes in the cultural appropriation aspect of this, because I don't mm. want people to be like, I don't have any traditions to draw upon, so I'm just going to kind of lift it off of other people who still have those traditions intact. Word. But also acknowledging that we don't have those traditions maybe intact in our lineages any longer, seemingly. And so what would you recommend as far as... I just said. You just need to dig deeper. Just got to dig deeper. Yeah. Okay. 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 (laughs) That's That's it. it. That's it. Just dig deeper. Everybody's connected to the five elements and connected to the seasons and connected to the forces that are the generative forces in life um, that move through our bodies cyclically. Everybody is connected to them. And if you can't see that in your lineage, then you're not looking far enough back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we can enjoy some traditions from other cultures with permission and with 
extreme amounts of respect and acknowledgement and clarity about where the lineage came from, right? So right. permission mm -hmm. and clarity of where the lineage came from. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Sure. And, and so then I would, I, you know, this is actually more of a political question in a sense, because mm -hmm. it's going to have a political dimension to it. But I'm getting the sense that you have, well, I don't think it's a sense. I think I pretty much know that you're basically an anarchist in, <laughs> in this sense, right? Like you're like, I don't need a state or some big thing to administer health and, um, yeah, you know, to the population. We can basically manage that ourselves. That's what you're saying. To a great degree. To a great degree. To like, if we had to use the number thing, like 95% of the time. 95% <laughs> of the time. Okay, perfect. That's a great statistic. Um, so this whole debate around reproductive rights and um, abortion, again, mm -hmm. another loaded term, but like Roe v. Wade, overturning Roe v. Wade, you've got these like very strong uh, conservative uh, political groups, religious groups that are pushing very hard and it's a long game for them. They are like, we're going to get conservative judges in there. We're going to get conservative Congress. We're going to push for conservative, you know, just let's get this thing overturned. Mm -hmm. So, so much of the debate or so much of the activism or whatever surrounding um, pro-choice activism um, rights is, is centered around this legislation, is centered around whether the state has the ability right. to administer uh -huh. abortion services, right? What is your take on that? Like, how do you feel about all of that? Yeah, I think it's really unwise to ask for permission to take care of your body mm -hmm. and that it is wise to learn how to care for yourself. Mm -hmm. So, so but the, I think the thing that people are still wary of is like, well, abortion seems like a pretty intense procedure. You need someone who's very highly qualified. And I understand it because like leading up to before Roe v. Wade was passed, women sought abortions, whether it was legal or not, whether they had it's any- ancient. It's ancient, it's exactly. It's not even, like, there's cultural right. amnesia about the reality that contraception and abortion have been basic parts of human existence since humans have existed. Okay. Not only has it been a basic and common part of human existence, it is everywhere in the plant and animal kingdom as well in different versions. Our ability to self-regulate our propagation mm -hmm. is an innate part of aliveness. And the church and state... Mm -hmm. have no ability to regulate our aliveness or our access to vital essence. Okay. Well, then what do you say then when people have these horror stories, and they're very real horror stories of what it was like before you could go and get um, easy access to abortions um, in a clinic? Like, you know, the yeah. the, 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 the hanger, the clothes hanger, the, yeah. the whole horrifying stories you hear of women bleeding out and dying because they had to go to some shady... That's not because of lack of... That's, la that's lack of education. Lack of education. And lack of care. Okay. Yeah. Right. So it's it's not like you're... Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to suss out the nuances of it. Is yeah, all, it's a know? very nuanced conversation. Um, we deserve access to medical care mm -hmm. when we need medical care. Mm -hmm. Managing our fertility, if we are properly educated and supplied, is not a medical crisis or a medical experience it does not need to be medicalized okay right right okay so I, and, the, and this is what i mean is like you're at this cutting edge i feel like um because this isn't the conversation i'm hearing from anyone having discussions about whether women should have access to these services or sure. not do you know we what i mean absolutely deserve access to any kind of service or care that we want mm -hmm. and to completely rely upon the industry and the regulation of our government to be able to navigate fertility management is part of an oppressive culture, is part of an illusion that needs to be dispelled. And it really, I would just love to take it back to ovulation. Absolutely. <laughs> right? So that was actually the biggest part of my um, triggered 
anxiety brain around the whole abortion ban conversation, entering the social media mm-hmm. and entering my interpersonal conversations constantly. I'm just like, fuck this conversation about abortion. We need to be talking about ovulation and we need to talk about ovulation with every single 10 year old before they start ovulating right? to tell them how they can tell when it's happening mm-hmm. and that they have the ability and the power to discern. Right. Right. When they're fertile, and then we need to fucking end rape culture <laughs> yeah. so that we can advocate and implement where the sperm goes, right? right, right. So I'm just like, I forget, I think it's at Yates. It's like the, for everybody, uh, like, hacking at the branches, there's one person pulling at the root. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yes, the conversation about the legality of abortion or our ability to manage our fertility outside of a clinical model of care, which is an ancient and human right skill for us to have. Okay. Um, it is not a 20th or 20th, 21st century phenomena. Yeah. Um, like, people with uteruses have known how to manage and support one another managing their fertility since we humans began. So another assumption I want to ask you, I think people have is like, well, we have these amazing, we, we have now have medical technology that makes abortion better than it's ever been, or that we have, yeah, definitely. or that we have Super effective. also birth control pills, which again, is another topic, uh-huh. you know, but I, the reason why I brought that part up is because I remember I had this c- I was having this conversation with this woman, uh, this person who um, takes birth control pills. Mm. And I think it was me or someone else had brought up, well, actually, people have been using forms of birth control involving whatever sort of um, holistic um, plants or whatever it is to, to help manage that. And this person responded, well, no, I want my birth control pills. Like, that sounds barbaric or that sounds sure. pre-modern. Totally, because she has no idea how to tell mm. when she might ovulate or that that's something she even could know. Right. Yeah. So I just, I'm just saying, like, with you, I mean, you're probably coming up against so many deeply held cultural assumptions. Sure. I mean, you're coming up against some of mine. And yeah. I was like, I thought I didn't have them. I was All like, day, every day. Yeah, every- <laughs> uh-huh. Forever right. and right. ever. Yeah. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Not going to end in my lifetime. <laughs> I don't know if you had a question, but I have lots of comments. <laughs> Please share your comments. Yeah. Um, so language mm-hmm. is something that I'm super fascinated by and mm-hmm. in love with. And I'm very intentional and conscious when I write and when I speak and teach and work with clients um, about language and birth control as a term is one thing that I have worked really hard to let go of in my vernacular. Okay. Um, And I really would love to invite anybody listening and or you to join me in calling birth control pills or uh, hormonal contraceptives medications um, ovulation prevention pills. (laughs) Well, that's what they are. I know. That's what they are, yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah. birth control, it's not controlling birth. It's preventing ovulation. And sure, that has the ability to influence whether or not you give birth. And I get that. But I think, again, striking at the root instead of the branch of the issue and as sort of a public service announcement. <laughs> right. Yeah. Of like, hey, when you take that pill, you're preventing yourself from ovulating. Yeah. Um, And so preventing yourself from ovulating, what's wrong with that, right? Well, your body is an ecosystem. Your ovaries have endocrine glands in them that communicate with the hypothalamus pituitary axis gland, which is a really cool spot in your brain that tells all these other parts of your body how to work, how to think, how to digest, how to do all sorts of different really important tasks. And the communication between your ovaries and your hypothalamus Mm-hmm. pituitary mm-hmm. access mm-hmm. gland it's really fucking important yeah <laughs> so if like you it. completely shut down that communication it is really likely that you're going to have health issues in the long run and this medication mm-hmm. has not been approved or researched nearly as well as it needs to be there's so many issues with it there's the book sweetening the pill 
Um, and the fifth vital sign would be my two top recommendations if people would like to read more of the clinical studies and the conversation around uh, big uh, pharma, right? So Monsanto sure. and Bayer mm-hmm. just merged recently. Right, yeah, yeah. And Bayer owned the vast majority of clinical options for ovulation prevention pills yeah i was about to say like (laughs) birth no (laughs) and marinas and a whole bunch of other uh like ways that Mm -hmm. they essentially castrate us and tell us that it's our liberation wow (laughs) this is a great emma goldman quote oh shit i hope i can do it justice i already i do love emma goldman yeah it's just something around and i'm not going to get it perfect but it's like the modern woman must emancipate herself from emancipation in order to truly be free. Is it at the end of that blog post? Yeah, I'm trying to Maybe. find it. Yeah. It's a good one. I love she got arrested for um distributing information about contraception. Um was her first arrest. I read Yeah. Yeah, I got it right here. I'll quote it. But I, I read her autobiography Yay. a long time ago because I was like an anarchist and I'm like, Who's, yeah. she's a big deal. She is a big deal. But there's a lot going Another on Jewish. in her life. Yeah. yeah. Another big deal Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> she said, <laughs> merely, external, merely external emancipation has made the modern woman an artificial being. Now women, woman is confronted with the necessity of emancipating herself from emancipation if she really desires to be free yeah yeah hell of a thing i mean the whole it's like such a 1984 like orwellian thing of like freedom and slavery slavery is freedom of like here just take this pill every day and (laughs) you don't need to worry about your sexual sovereignty or fertility anymore isn't that kind of a component of at least some of feminism which is this idea that um to liberate women is to liberate themselves from these these ovulation from sure. menstruation yeah. from being from having a womb basically mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um which i would say is still there i mean there's there are different dimensions of that that i do respect and understand but for the most part that first wave feminist conversation um it's still like bypassing our biology right in order to meet these standards of success and stasis mm-hmm. and productivity mm-hmm. that are created by capitalism and patriarchy right does that make sense yeah so it's yeah. again those deeply held assumptions that are not necessarily examined when it comes to these subjects right a little bit yeah it's a big part of it's it it's forever yeah, you're just like, um, I'm just going for it. No, the rest good. of your life, yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, birth control, conscious contraception is the terminology that I like to use. Conscious con- um, contraception. And I have a, an online course by that title okay. that takes you through both physical and energy anatomy of fertility mm-hmm. so that we know how to move mm-hmm. right. our bodies to, to be in alignment with what it is that we're trying to conceive and gestate when it's not a child. And I feel like actually fully claiming and articulating what it is that we are doing with our vital essence every single fucking time that we have sex. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Is a, a, an opportunity for healing our culture around contraception and abortion for that matter. Okay. Um, and that, that that's actually extremely erotic to me. It really turns me on. I like it (laughs) instead of being like, oh, well, I don't want to think about that. I'm like, no, no, no. Thinking about my ability to create life and what I'm doing with that is Yeah, so it's an energy source. It's it's an energy source, as you said in that that static ovulation awareness essay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to fit that into conscious, to talk about conscious contraception. I have a hard time with those two words. (laughs) Conscious contraception. Um, Just getting the words out of my mouth. Yeah. so, you know, I, I think I asked before we started, like, have you had a, a I guess to use the word male or, you know, someone like me interview yeah. you before? And you were like, I did one time for NPR, you know. <laughs> but I think I want to include myself because I, I want to be a part of this. I, I don't want this to feel like it's, I'm not trying to like say like I'm observing it like objectively, like, oh, you know, women or women bodied uh, identity people are, um 
this thing that I'm observing and analyzing. I mean, this is, these are my best friends. These are people that I, I'm in love with. You know, these are people that um, I'm deeply committed to. So how for myself and for other, if I could maybe say cisgendered, heterosexual, heterosexual, heteronormative men mm -hmm. that love women in all the capacities that come with that, um, how do we approach contraception consciously? How do we how do we understand where our role is in all of this? Because there has to be that balance, right? You know, right? Because mm -hmm. you're fertile every day. Yep. <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah, I'm yeah. only fertile for like three or six days out of the month. Right. Yeah. So exactly. It's ridiculous that I should be the one. <laughs> no. No. I mean, to deal with all of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Learn how to tell when somebody's ovulating. <laughs> okay. Learn how to think about <laughs> where the sperm goes and have a conversation about it every time. Every single time that you are anywhere near a vulva or a vagina mm -hmm. and might ejaculate. Okay. Um, it's just responsibility. Yeah. Just yeah. basic shit. I mean, maybe learn some Taoist microcosmic orbit meditation and learn how to have orgasms where you don't ejaculate. That's also a pretty cool way to deal with it. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I didn't mean it in like, I and mean, it sounds like it just sounds like such no, a basic okay. thing. And I don't want to yeah. like make you explain something that should just be apparent or obvious to, I just oh. am kind of wanting to include that perspective, you know? Yeah, of, that I don't sound condescending. I don't mean to. No, you're not. Um, um, but it's one of those things like, it's not my responsibility to yeah. tell you how to oh, conduct the ally, your, like, yeah. And I'm like, mm, well, mm -hmm. I get that. It's exhausting yeah. trying to talk to ignorant people all day. Yeah. You know, like they just don't yeah. get basic shit, but it's like coming from a genuine, genuine, genuine place of curiosity and respect. Yeah. Right. Another online course is currently being formed. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Sermon for the Sperman. Sermon I'm for the Sperman. I'm not even kidding. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, I'm paying my boyfriend to translate. Okay. My conscious contraception course which I created for people who ovulate mm -hmm. into something that he thinks that people with sperm will understand better. Okay. Um, so again, walking through both physical and energy anatomy of mm -hmm. fertility of ovulation and menstruation and of sperm, mm -hmm. because the vast majority of individuals have very little to no understanding of how these things work. What we received in school was not adequate. Like, for example, if you conceive, which happens like with an actual flash of light. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think right? it's like a zinc uh, thing. Um, it's a mineral reaction. If one conceives, it takes about three days for that zygote to make it down the egg tube into the uterus and then it will take an average of one week after that to actually embed itself so most of us think of a pregnancy or a pregnancy scare as like oh shit i got pregnant or like yeah oh i oh no you're pregnant now and it's like no 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 like just because you have some multiplying cells in you right doesn't mean you're pregnant it means you've got a zygote or a few days later you've got a little blastocyst living not attached to the maternal blood network Right. So I guess moving back to your question, like learn your anatomy, learn the anatomy of ovulation, learn the anatomy of conception, get really clear about the geography, about the physical reality of the territory that you're working with so you can navigate it better. Right. Well, I think that you're, you're asking me and you're asking others to just, this is sort of the thing about freedom right to be truly liberated as an individual mm -hmm. and as maybe a community if that's if that's where you're at as well um it's just about responsibility mm -hmm. that's it right that's 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 what you're saying is like uh, just take responsibility that you're a human being a part of a bigger system yeah it's hard i mean like systematic oppression is a thing that has been yeah. preventing a lot of us from relating rationally mm -hmm. to our fertility and sexuality. We are dealing with like thousands of years of right. oppression and compartmentalization and patriarchy. It's, you know, we're, we're in the struggle. I respect everyone at their stage of consciousness. Sure. Uh, but yeah, like wake up, learn how your body works. Mm -hmm. Like you communicate about mm. sex, communicate about fertility 
Um, I use the term sovereignty a lot in my work as well. And I think this speaks, this, this circles back again to that, like, get clear about the geography, the territory. Yeah. Uh, the word sovereignty has that word reign mm -hmm. in it. And it's a very political government implication of a word, right? Like you yeah. have a ter a sovereign kingdom or queendom or territory. And if you don't actually know the geography of that territory, there's no way that you're going to govern it sovereignly. Right. So yeah. like just starting with that basic curiosity that, and then moving towards clarity with how your body works. Yeah. Um, and that tying back to the <laughs> mapping the Yoniverse book. <laughs> nice. um, part of why I made this book is because it is like the 101 yeah. <laughs> to any class I would ever teach. I, it's really difficult for me to talk about the more nuanced and in-depth topics that I speak about when people do not know what's in this book. And the vast majority of people if not all of them that I have ever counseled as a client or taught as a student don't actually know all of this. <laughs> yeah. Well, so something that came up when I was reading it was it reminded me, it, it kind of tied into this experience I had. I saw this documentary um, called American Circumcision. You, Oy, ever, you yeah. ever seen it? No, but I'm, I'm there. So I'll just say this. <laughs> yeah. So I was lucky. Mm -hmm. This is something everybody. Hey, by the way, I, I wasn't circumcised. I was. I, I escaped the blade. Congratulations! I know, and it was totally almost a fluke in a way. Like Aww. my parents, when I was born, they were fighting or something, and my mom was like, "I don't want to deal with a baby who's." <laughs> bleep. No, I don't want to deal with genitally mutilating my child. I know. Well, mm, what a bother. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> anyway, I, I escaped the blade. Yeah. But I sympathize or empathize with other. Um, uh, male-bodied individuals um, because that's so often not the case, at least in the United States. That's just such a common thing. So in this documentary, it examines those assumptions. It, it interviews people who are advocates for it and then advocates against. And it's so obvious the advocates for are just full of shit, you know? Like, it's just so obvious. Even yeah. with their best arguments, you're just like... Yeah. So, but the thing that came up, sorry, to get to the point... It's okay. ...is that it was examining foreskins and the penis as a whole thing. Um, and this person was explaining like all the, these different parts of the foreskin and what happens when you get circumcised, it removes all these things. It creates all these complications. These various forms of sensation are removed. Mm -hmm. And they actually had a part in there where they had a woman, um, an individual who had been, um, had, had been, uh, circumcised. She's a female, uh, and had been circumcised where she was from. You call it, they call it circumcision, genital mutilation. Mm -hmm. So she advocated in the United States for laws to ban that in the U.S. Even though it's not a commonly practiced thing, nonetheless, they got legislation because it's just so obvious that that's bad for for vaginas, for vulva, for whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, so my point is that I think for male-bodied individuals uh, who have penises... We don't even understand our penis. We think it's totally. just this unitary, blink, that's it. Yeah. But it's not. There's a lot going on, and especially with foreskins. <sighs> so I just wanted to kind of articulate that from my end of things, where I'm coming from, we're in a deep well of, like, ignorance. And it's like, we're finding the pieces, and we're putting yeah. them together. And I feel like you, speaking from my, my where I'm sitting now in my journey in life, that you're kind of a part of this process of kind Thank of you. shedding light on really necessary things, really necessary information. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Foreskins are so valuable. We should yeah. not cut them off. Well, and the other thing in this is you, I mean, I think what, what, when I talked to Cassandra who turned me on to this book and, um, I was talking about, I was like kind of breaking down the anatomy of the clitoris Yeah. and there was very specific things that you were pointing. I don't know. I can't find it, but the point is, is that, when the clitoris is aroused. Your dick is a big clit, darling. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like it becomes we aroused. It. it gets erect. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh. Before like Before your little Y chromosome switched on around seven weeks gestation. It was we had the same tissue. Yeah. Same structure. Yeah. And yours grew outside. Right. And mine grew inside. Mm -hmm. But on average inch for inch, pound for pound, they're the same. 
Okay. Mine's internal. Mm -hmm. The shaft of my clit will be an average of about four inches when it's engorged. So it's a little smaller when sure. it's inside, right. but it's pretty big. Yeah, no, it's a big thing. It's a but big it's thing just full of erectile tissue. And it's just hidden under the skin, you it's know, it's just... just hidden. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, I think I just really appreciated how in-depth you got and how you made that connection, which I had yeah. heard about, but you really, like, break it down in a technical and visual sense. Hooray! So I think you're successful Yay! reading this, this. thank you. It's funny because I tell people, it's a coloring <laughs> book, but I'm like, that's, it's true, it's a coloring book. There's a lot going on. It's not. Yeah. It's it's a. There's a lot of text. It's it's informant. There's just just to give you like if you can see that, just that's you know. actually one of the most unique the glands and challenging illustrations I, that took us a really really long time to dial in. Yeah, that I can imagine this would be difficult to put together. But also you got these visualizations like years. like this, like you're showing. There yeah. is a rugia, rugia, rugae, rugae, rugae. But you're using the accordion. Yeah. Anal analogy or metaphor. I love that illustration. I, and I'm just like, perfect. Like, that's how I made it, her draw that one like five times because she was not happy enough. I'm like, the lady with the accordion's she not needs, happy she, enough. She needs to be ecstatic. She needs to be ecstatic. <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, so I want to turn... Winding down. Yeah, I know, we're winding down. Did you have any more, like, topics, though, that oh, you wanted geez. to address? Because I know, no. like, because I remember what we're talking, like, this oh, this a is a... great arc. Yeah. Okay, good, okay. Yeah. I want to do justice to your work oh, and you... representing mm -hmm. it. And I feel like because you're... Now that I know you, I mean, I probably would do follow-up interviews where oh, we could... Cool. Where, where you, when you said earlier, like, this is a whole other podcast episode. Yeah. This is a whole yeah. other, like, I, I, I sense that too. Sure. I think there's, there's a I lot think to explore. I the other thing that I said when we were texting mm -hmm. that, you know, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time discussing right now, but that I would like to share with the audience and it really mm -hmm. circles back to the legalization um, of abortion and clinical access to abortion is that a fun thing to think about Okay. <laughs> or study up on or see the parallel between, uh, in my in my opinion, and for probably anybody who is an activist or an anarchist in mm -hmm. any way, mm -hmm. is the, the parallel between food justice mm -hmm. and food sovereignty movements and womb justice and womb sovereignty movements, reproductive justice movements. Yeah. And that the powers that be who have created this illusion and this reality both mm -hmm. of monopolizing our ability to navigate how we sustain ourselves, right? right? Our access to food and our access to governing our own fer fertility, the fertility of the earth, the fertility of the soil, the fertility of our bodies. Our bodies are the earth um, that politically and economically uh, and socially that these two uh, movements, these two realities have a lot of intersection. Yeah. And I feel like that helps people specifically around contraception and abortion. Right. Understand that it's inappropriate for the church or state to be regulating our access yeah. to education about how to grow or not grow people. Right. inside of our bodies right, right. in the same way that it's inappropriate for the church or state to be regulating our ability to grow food to eat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I think that, that the oppression of women, of people, is directly correlated to how we treat the land. And and that's, that's the whole like theme of this whole podcast, you know, in general, I've yeah. talked so much about is... Um, there's a lot of parallels here. And so... Shall I, we close with some Wendelberry? Yeah, Wendelberry, <laughs> of course. Ah! <laughs> and a Facebook message sound. Um, yeah. While we live, our bodies are moving particles of the earth, joined inextricably both to the soil and to the bodies of other living creatures. It is hardly surprising, then, that there should be some profound resemblances between our treatment of the bodies and our treatment of the earth. Mm. Uh. And the, the, actually, the rest of that essay goes on to speak more about the spirituality of those things as well. That's like a little quote. Right. But reading farther into that, I'm blanking out on what essay it's from. Um, 
but he he goes on to discuss the spiritual nature of the way that we tend to our bodies. Yeah. Wendell Berry is amazing. Yeah. It's a great way to, yeah. to end this. Soften. Well, I'll ask real quick. So do you have a timeline for this book coming out? Yeah, yeah. It'll be out by solstice at the latest is what I'm going to say. Um, okay. But you can join my Patreon community for as little as $3 a month. Or 13 Um <laughs> I really like the two yeah. options there. Like it was like the, like very specific, and I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Thirteen moons. I work a lot with numerology and yeah. and magic and whatnot. Um, yeah, mapping the universe is on Patreon. It'll be on my website later. Um, yeah, you and you find my website. It's my name dot com. <laughs> um, Samantha Zipora, Z I P P O R A H. And you can see all the things that you can right. can receive from me. You have ebooks on there. You on have all kinds interwebs. of services, various forms of information. My You're writing, busy lady, interviews, <laughs> things like that. Yeah, you are. But I love to help. So mm-hmm. really, genuinely, that's part of um, you know having healthy boundaries and being able to assert them is more that like ask me anything, and just trust that if it's not appropriate or I don't have the time to help you, I'll just say so. Okay. Um, but I really want to encourage folks to reach out if they are looking for resources, looking for support, looking for education. Um, please drop me a line. I prefer email or through the contact form on my website um, to social media messages. I do not uh, accept direct messages on social media. It was uh, for too long and still occasionally people try and use me as a crisis hotline. And oh, yeah. I have retired from my, my crisis hotline work. You can find crisis hotline links on my website. <laughs> Perfect. All the resources are there. Yeah. Okay. People are afraid of pregnancy and fertility. Yeah. And they call me freaking out about it. I'm like, oh, God, I have a body. I don't understand it. Hmm. I need you to help. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. And I think it's good for you just for your own mental, spiritual, physical yeah, well-being. Thank you. Because I'm – maybe I talk about it after the, all in the recording. I'll sure. just say thank you so much. Yeah. This has been great. This is your beautiful home. Thank you for letting me come in and sit with you and yeah. talk with you. It's been really great. Yeah, it's been wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Cheers.